welcome to Arbitral Insights, a podcast series brought to you by our international arbitration practice lawyers here at Reed Smith. I'm Peter Rocha, Global Head of Reed Smith's International Arbitration Practice. I hope you enjoy the industry commentary, insights and anecdotes we share with you in the course of this series, wherever in the world you are. If you have any questions about any of the topics discussed, please do contact our speakers. And with that, let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of Arbitral Insights. And this is the first episode in a series discussing reforms to the Arbitration Act 1996 proposed by the Law Commission. I'm Barta Krutkowski, a senior associate in the Energy and Natural Resources Group at Reed Smith in London. And I am joined today by Antonia Bird, a partner in our Global Commercial Disputes Group in Dubai, and Liam Hart, a fellow, a senior associate in the energy and natural resources in London. Let us start with a short introduction to the Law Commission and its recent work in relation to the Arbitration Act. Law Commission is an independent body tasked with keeping all English law under review and recommending reforms where needed. In March 2021, it was specifically tasked with conducting a review of the Arbitration Act in order to make sure that it is still fit for purpose and reflective of England as a leading destination for commercial arbitration. The Commission published two consultation papers, one in September 2022 and another in March 23. Those papers included uh, the Commission's analysis of the current law, um, their ideas of potential issues and areas for reform and provisional proposals for those reforms. The consultation then generated a significant number of responses from a wide range of arbitration users. Those included major law firms, uh, individual practitioners, barristers, judges, academics, and arbitration institutions themselves. The Law Commission then published its report in September this year. And in the report, it reached a conclusion that there was no need nor any desire for a wholesale reform of arbitration act but it did set a number of targeted recommendations for how to modernise the Act and further solidify London as a leading centre for international arbitration. One of the most significant among those proposed targeted changes, and the one we wanted to discuss in this episode, relates to the approach to summary disposal. So, Liam, perhaps if you can start us off by telling us a bit more about what we mean by summary disposal. Thanks, Bartek. Sure. So one of the biggest procedural differences between English court proceedings and English seated arbitration is that a court may decide a claim or issue without a trial if it considers that a party has what is described as, and I'm quoting here, no real prospects of success. Now, that summary judgment process aims to save time and cost by allowing the court to dismiss meritless claims at a relatively early stage of proceedings. And it's quite a common feature of English litigation, but as I say, it's rare in arbitration. Now, the reason it's relatively rare in arbitration is because arbitrators are under a statutory duty in England to give each party a reasonable opportunity to put their case. And if they fail to do so, the arbitrator's award can be challenged before the courts in England, and recognition and enforcement of the award can also be refused by foreign courts. Now, what that means is that arbitrators are often reluctant to summarily dispose of cases. And for similar reasons, summary processes are rarely used, even if they're available under the applicable arbitral rules. That has important practical implications, because even if a party has a completely meritless case, it can still engage in a drawn out arbitration to apply commercial pressure on an opponent, who might then be persuaded to seek settlement rather than spend time and money dealing with the arbitration. Great, Liam. Thank you for that. And how does the Law Commission then propose to deal with the issue of summary disposal? Well, what the Law Commission proposes is that the Arbitration Act should be amended to provide that subject to the agreement of the parties, an arbitral tribunal may, on the application of a party, adopt a summary procedure to decide a claim or an issue. Now, the precise detail of the summary procedure to be adopted would be a matter for the arbitral tribunal having regard to the specific circumstances of the case in consultation with the parties. Now, 
that proposal, broadly speaking, has been welcomed by most lawyers and arbitration users consulted by the Law Commission. Okay, and how would arbitrators decide if there should be summary disposal in a given case? Law Commission proposes to use a test that applies in the English courts, which is, as I said earlier, no real prospects of success. Okay, I'm I'm doing air marks with that when I say that, no real prospects of success, on the basis that that test is a well understood meaning, which has already been explained in in English case law. And in, in your view, what are the pros and cons of adopting that approach in arbitration? Well, on the, on the plus side, the fact that there's a well-established test in case law for no real prospects of success means that the issue doesn't have to be extensively relitigated to understand its scope. And that means that we as lawyers can provide clients with firmer advice as to how the concept would be interpreted by an arbitral tribunal than, than would otherwise be the case. M- more negatively, importing a test derived from English court rules might add to the view held by by some international users of uh, English arbitration that English arbitration is too closely aligned with the culture and practice of, of the English courts. Now, it's sometimes said that that English approach can manifest itself in, for example, relatively wide-ranging document production and a pleading style that's derived ultimately from the approach taken in the English courts by English barristers. Either way, I guess a cynic might argue that this will be Fairly good news for English qualified arbitration lawyers uh, because it'll be potentially easier for English qualified lawyers to navigate these principles which are derived from the English court rules. Thank you, Liam. Um, on that note, turning slightly away from England and to Antonia. Um, Antonia, as a partner in our Dubai office, can you tell us a bit more about the approach to summary disposal, whether of this kind of, or any other kind in arbitration in the Middle East? Yeah, thanks very much, Bartek. And you've sort of uh, guessed what I'm going to say there, because uh, the answer, I think, to the question is it's not sort of quite summary disposition, uh, but maybe there are other kinds that are available here. To some extent, similar to the rest of the world, this region does not traditionally see uh, requests for summary disposition. There are, uh, I would say, a few reasons for this. One sort of also similar to the point Liam was just making about the situation in, in the UK where, to some extent, arbitration is um, uh, develops on the basis of sort of uh, some court litigation experience. Uh, similarly here, because the court litigation process does not generally allow for summary disposition, um, it's unfamiliar uh, in the region and hence it's unfamiliar in arbitration. So we've got that problem. Uh, secondly, the rules that were previously used in the region didn't really allow for summary disposition. I should say that that's sort of changing. You now, just this year, we have the new rules of the Saudi Center that introduced summary disposition. Um, Of course, also in this region, we use the LCA rules uh, quite regularly, which obviously nowadays also provide for this. So uh, we we will probably see some more uh, applications in the future, but so far there haven't been all uh, that many that have been publicized. Um, I should also say that the BCDR rules actually in the region do provide for summary disposition, um, but again, they're not not relied on um, as much. Um, and maybe the third reason why we don't see uh, summary disposition as much in the region is also related to the fact that sort of the point I think Liam mentioned earlier regarding to procedural due process issues. So procedural formalism here is really treated with utmost gravity. Uh, Arbitrators in the region, of course, need to ensure that the awards are uh, enforceable and therefore they do take really heightened vigilance, I would say, uh, to ensure the sanctity of due process. And this is, of course, you know, a careful approach that may be be useful in this particular region. But but yeah, as I was sort of suggesting when I started uh, started answering your question, uh, it's not that the arbitration landscape is rigid. There are responses and adaptations to to requirements. So, for example, over the last few years, expedited proceedings have been adopted uh, very much throughout the region, uh, which apply to smaller proceedings. So not not quite the same as summary disposition, but at least for smaller value claims, there's now an opportunity to resolve them very quickly. The, the final point I guess to make is that uh, same as in other regions, arbitrators in this region under all the typical rules 
have very wide case management powers. Um, and one way we have seen summary disposition take place to some extent is uh, via bifurcation proceedings. Um, again, it's not quite the same because, of course, in a bifurcated uh, proceeding whereby, for example, one issue is considered first, it doesn't mean that that issue doesn't get its full procedural process. Um, it, in a bifurcated process, you still consider that issue insufficient depth. But for certain issues, for, for, for example, contractual interpretation questions, etc., bifurcation has offered an opportunity to resolve issues quickly and thereby help, for example, settle the dispute uh, once that issue has been resolved. So those kind of tools have always been available and, and have been used in the region and have been uh, have seen awards that are uh, enforced. That's great. Thank you. Very interesting context and to some extent contrast to the position and the proposed reforms in England. Now, Lee, I'm turning back to you and turning back to England. Do you think that summary disposal will be available in all cases if the proposed reforms are adopted? Well, to some extent, that remains to be seen if and when these reforms are implemented. But but I think we can say probably not at this stage. That's because English law doesn't view summary judgment as appropriate for all kinds of cases before the courts. And given that the test that is going to be applied uh, is based on the approach taken in the courts, it's likely that arbitral tribunals will follow a similar approach. I'll give you an example. Um, summary judgment is rarely ordered in circumstances where factual evidence is required to deal with an issue. And that's because those cases are by their very nature, uh, the types of cases that require a tribunal to hear evidence uh, at trial. And those types of cases include situations where one side alleges that a term of a contract has been waived orally or varied, or where the underlying dispute is whether an oral contract was formed. Similarly, it's also rare to see summary judgment in cases where there are complex factual and technical issues because they often require expert evidence. And so if you're going to have expert evidence, um, it's difficult to dispose of that before um, interrogating that evidence at trial. It therefore remains to be seen how the proposed changes to the uh, Arbitration Acts would apply in practice to things like delay or disruption cases in the construction industry, which often require expert evidence or cases dealing with uh, alleged defects. Also, cases involving allegations of fraud are, are quite problematic with regard to summary disposal because the case law dealing with summary judgment in litigation suggests that courts are willing to make findings of dishonesty only if they've you know, tested the evidence with regard to dishonesty at trial. And also, th there's an element of wanting to give someone accused of dishonesty their day in court rather than find uh, that they've been dishonest, you know, which could have an impact on their professional or commercial life. Thanks, Liam. So obviously a, a clear practical question about how um, will those rules be applied in practice and what will be the scope of that. What other practical issues do you see potentially arising in this context? Well, I can think of four kind of practical points that, that arise. Firstly, one could foresee arguments about the meaning and effect of contractual time bars I'd imagine that those kinds of arguments are going to be even more front-loaded and take on a more additional importance than they otherwise might. Now, as you probably know, time bar provisions are particularly common in, for example, certain standard form construction contracts that require notice of claims to be given within specified periods. So, so how this kind of tactical jousting applies in construction cases where notice periods are at play is, is going to be particularly interesting. Secondly, in relation to enforceability, I, I think the question still remains whether even with the inclusion of, a, of an express statutory power of summary disposal, a foreign court would refuse enforcement on the basis that the losing party had been afforded insufficient opportunity to put its case. And it might follow that if a claimant is worried about enforcing a summary award in a particular jurisdiction, then it might make sense for them to avoid applying for, for summary disposal. Thirdly, it's potentially the case that summary disposal applications may be used or abused 
for purely tactical reasons, such as to delay a full trial of the issues. Um, certainly that kind of tactical approach is, is no stranger to people who use the courts in, in England. And fourthly, there are likely to be arguments about the timing of summary disposal applications. One might expect to see arguments that summary judgment should only be available after discovery of documents or after expert evidence has been exchanged. And there's some case law in that court context to suggest that summary judgment will only be ordered in cases that revolve around expert evidence after the exchange of experts' reports. Thank you, Liam. Plenty to think about. Antonia, do you have any additional thoughts on other practical issues or points that may arise in this context? Yes, yeah, thanks very much, Bart. Uh, first of all, speaking from the Middle East region, I really couldn't agree more with uh, Liam's second point uh, relating to enforceability. And until the judiciary across the key seats here in the region becomes accustomed to the summary proceedings, there's certainly a risk. So I would, I would expect to see some test cases in the future once uh, some of the provisions in the uh, rules that are used here more often become uh, more readily available, more readily used. So we'll see how that goes. Um, and this is, of course, a concern uh, worldwide to some extent, um, wherever summary disposition may be less uh, familiar to the local courts, uh, local court proceedings. I, I mentioned earlier when I spoke uh, in the in the local court jurisdictions here, uh, this is not a procedural tool that is generally available. So this interplay between national laws uh, and arbitration is certainly something to be considered, depending on, I would say, where the assets are located. So if there is a, a need to enforce this award in a region where these proceedings are less, uh, less known, then that's certainly a consideration to bear in mind when requesting this kind of tool. Um, but I would like to end on a positive note. And as uh, in, in my view, at least, as the arbitration community gets uh, more used to availability of summary procedures, the main implication for me will be a positive one, um, which is, of course, the ability of parties to push back on claims which really should not have been raised. Uh, and this, in turn, will, of course, uh, limit some of the tactics that uh, we nowadays uh, see in play uh, in arbitration proceedings. So I do hope that uh, overall uh, the impacts will be positive. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you both, Antonio and Liam. Um, it was clearly a fascinating discussion and there's obviously important practical and strategic considerations around this topic that arbitration users will need to keep in mind both when engaging in arbitration and when negotiating the uh, arbitration agreements if those proposals proposed by um, the Commission are adopted. Thank you for everyone listening, and keep an eye out for our next podcast in this series, which will address the proposed reforms to the Arbitration Act, dealing with the law governing the arbitration agreement. Thank you very much. Arbitral Insights is a Reed Smith production. Our producer is Ali McArdle. For more information about Reed Smith's global international arbitration practice, email arbitralinsights at reedsmith.com. To learn about the Reed Smith Arbitration Pricing Calculator, a first-of-its-kind mobile app that forecasts the cost of arbitration around the world, search Arbitration Pricing Calculator on reedsmith.com or download for free through the Apple and Google Play app stores. You can find our podcast on Spotify, Apple, Google Play, Stitcher, ReadSmith.com, and our social media accounts at ReadSmith LLP on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. This podcast is provided for educational purposes. It does not constitute legal advice and is not intended to establish an attorney-client relationship, nor is it intended to suggest or establish standards of care applicable to particular lawyers in any given situation. Prior results do not guarantee a similar outcome. Any views, opinions, or comments made by any external guest speaker are not to be attributed to Reed Smith LLP or its individual lawyers. All rights reserved.